Hi everyone, thank you so much for logging on today and joining us for our Care Connect combo. Today we are focusing on heart health with Dr. Wagley at our Tanglewood location. So we're going to start our conversation with him in just a few minutes. Um, we have quite a few people logging on, so we'll just make sure we don't have any technology issues or issues with y'all hearing us or seeing us. We'll give everyone just a few minutes before we get started. While we're waiting, though, Dr. Wagley, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and your practice here at Kelsey? Sure. Yeah, I was uh, um, uh, happy to be here and do this uh, uh, for some of our patients out there today. Um, I grew up in Houston. I was born and raised here. I went to uh, Rice University and Baylor College of Medicine for my undergraduate and medical school training, and then went away to uh, Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore for my residency training in internal medicine, and uh, did a year of research as well uh, there um, on some inherited uh, heart failure uh, conditions, uh, and then uh, went over to San Francisco at the University of California, uh, San Francisco uh, campus, and did my uh, cardiovascular uh, disease training program uh, for fellowship. Uh, after spending time there, then uh, we, my wife and I had a, had our first child and we wanted to move close back to the family. Uh, both hers and mine are in Houston. And so we uh, uh, looked for opportunities here in Houston and uh, found a great opportunity at Kelsey Siebold. And I've been here ever since uh, 2015 uh, when I first started uh, my career. And so, yeah, so it's been uh, six years now going on six uh, here at Kelsey. And yeah, it's been it's been great. Kelsey's a, a great organization to work for, um, and uh, excited to take care of uh, uh, heart patients here in Houston. Awesome, thank you for that brief bio. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right into our conversation. Um, I know a lot of you who are joining us have questions, and we definitely encourage you to ask them. If you are logging in on your computer, iPhone, or other device, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there are two little boxes. There's a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use those boxes, click on, um, click on them, type your questions. We'll do the best we can to answer those with the time we have today. Um, you know, Dr. Wagley does need to get back to see his patients, so we do have a hard stop at 1230, but we'll do our best to get those questions answered for you during the time we have with him. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in and talk about heart health. We originally had this scheduled during February, which I know is a huge, huge month to promote general heart health and wellness among patients here at Kelsey, um, but due to the freeze we had, we rescheduled for this month. Um, so let's talk a little bit about general heart health. Um, let's start with the younger population, maybe, you know, patients who would be in their 30s and 40s. What are some um, common, you know, questions or complaints or symptoms that patients in that age range come in with? Yeah, uh, so actually heart health should, we should start thinking about heart health in our 30s and 40s. In fact, probably even earlier than that, um, the, the uh, some studies show that heart disease, in, and we're talking about cholesterol buildup in the arteries inside our heart. Some studies show that that starts when we're teenagers. And so heart health should be discussed as early as possible, even with our children, uh, because habits that we form early on end up being how we live our life in our 20s, 30s, 40s. And so um, I think the error of, error of our past was to think that you to treat problems once they arise. And instead, if you make these changes uh, that are positive for your heart, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you may be seeing less cardiologists when you're in your 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so, um, so things to think about when you're in that uh, younger age range is uh, are things about mainly how your heart works. Your heart's a pump. It's it's kind of like the engine in your car. When you take it out on the highway, that's when the engine is sort of performing at its best. You leave the engine in the garage and don't tune the oil, don't change the spark plugs. You're going to have a rusty car when you need to finally drive it. Think about your heart the same way. What fuel are you putting into the uh, into the gas tank? So that's your food. Um, you think about the habits you have. When you're going to work, we spend most of our time in our week at work. And if not at work, we're sleeping. And so look at the habits you have when you're at work. What kind of meals are you picking when you go for breakfast or catching a snack in between breaks? And what kind of lunch are you having? Because if you change those things around at work and be a better person there, then you'll be able to actually do some, you know, fun stuff with your diet when you're with your friends and family on the weekends, because now you've already treated your body well and put good fuel in that gas tank for most of the week. 
So making those changes during your work week actually allow you to be a little, have a little bit more fun on the weekends. Um, then it comes down to, have you taken the engine out on the highway? Do you take yourself uh, out for exercise? Were you actually using your heart the way your heart was supposed to be used? Our hearts were not meant to sit behind computers all day. Our heart was not, is not meant to sit in a chair all day. Our hearts were meant to go around gathering fruits, vegetables, nuts, uh, going chasing deer and, and other prey. So are you using your heart the way that your heart was designed in your body to be used? Uh, so, so what's recommended by the American Heart Association, 75 minutes of that type of exercise per week. And so if you think about it, it's not that much. You can knock both of those, uh, uh, you can knock uh, 75 minutes out on a weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday exercising. So even if you've got a really rough week, uh, you can still get those benefits by just knocking out that time on the weekends. So making those changes in diet and your lifestyle are probably the things that are most important to start thinking about when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s. Then you, you start to get into the age in the 30s, 40s, 50s, where now you need to start looking at your blood pressure, your cholesterol, um, whether you have uh, the onset of diabetes. And, you know, a lot of that, it can be coming from a poor lifestyle and a poor diet. So you fix the diet and lifestyle, you may not be running into those other issues. Now, granted, some of those issues do come genetically. And so always good to do at least a once a year check, starting in your 30s, probably, where you're checking your cholesterol, checking your blood pressure, checking your uh, uh, fasting sugar levels to screen for diabetes. So you mentioned exercise. Um, is it possible to over-exercise? So um, I think it's important for you to understand your own body's limits. Uh, we have world-class athletes that can achieve things that probably you and I will never be able to achieve. And then uh, patients uh, who um, are limited because of other disabilities or uh, muscular issues. So you have to understand your body's limitations and what it's able to do. And you can work with your body to get those heart rate goals to achieve that exercise. So uh, there are goals for your heart rate that are based on your age. You can easily Google that and look that up. But uh, what I tell patients, which is a very easy thing to think about when you're exercising, is if you can talk on the phone while you're exercising, you could probably do a little bit more vigorous exercise than what you're already doing. And so uh, a lot of people like to exercise with buddies, go walking with a partner or a friend, uh, and uh, that's fine. But uh, if you've got to achieve that 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week, then it has to be something where it's uncomfortable to talk on the phone. So get to the point where it is a little uncomfortable talking on the phone, not so out of breath where you're gasping for air, you feel like your chest is heavy and you can't breathe. But I'm talking where it's you, you would just put the phone conversation down to be able to focus on the exercise. So if you can strike that balance, that's probably the best balance of exercise. And you'll find that as you do more and more, you're able to do more uh, exercise to achieve that same uh, uh, sort of uh, functional capacity. So let's talk a little bit about blood pressure and cholesterol. You mentioned that earlier, you know, once you start getting up there a little bit in age in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you should start having that checked. Can you explain, um, you know, sort of what are the normal ranges and abnormal ranges um, and what does it mean if you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol? So yeah, high blood pressure. Um, so we we say the norms for high blood pressure are a top number, which is called a systolic number of around 120 millimeters of mercury, and the bottom number, which is the diastolic blood pressure, is around 80 millimeters of mercury. We consider that the norm. Now, uh, in in daily practice, seeing patients, we'll we'll see that some patients, um, especially younger women, can oftentimes have a blood pressure that is much lower than that. Doesn't mean that that's abnormal. It just means that's their normal. So 120 over 80 is a gauge. It's a range, uh, but it's it should it's not the absolute that is considered normal. So some people can have a little bit lower, but typically we believe that if you have something that a blood pressure that is above that range, then you typically will be uh, considered a hypertensive patient. And we start to raise our eyebrows with numbers above 130. So it used to be that we would let the numbers we would say, okay, well if you're in the 140s on the systolic number, that's that top number. Now we need to start paying attention uh, to blood pressure lowering uh, strategies and, and medications. But now we've actually moved more aggressively because we've seen that even if your blood pressures are in the 130s for let's say three, four decades of your life, that actually may eventually cause heart disease long uh, uh, later in, in your life. So we really are starting to move towards being more aggressive 
on getting those numbers as close to 120 over 80. Um, now, there's a lot of school of thought out there that thinks lower is better. And so if you, let's say you were a younger woman in the, with having blood pressures in the 90s to 100s on the top number, then if your blood pressure starts to go up to the 120s, that may be hypertension for you. So it's important to know what your normal is, and you don't know, you only know what your normal is if you start checking it yourself. Uh, when you walk into a drugstore or pharmacy, you'll see that automatic blood pressure cuff. Put your arm in there and just get a random check. Come into Kelsey for a one-year annual annual checkup. Get your blood pressure readings. We track it on our app, so you'll be able to pull up your reading uh, as life goes on, and so you can track year by year what those numbers are. And then if you see it start to float up, now you know there's an issue to address. But if you see it rock solid stable, then you're doing good. Um, with cholesterol, it's a little bit more of a moving target in terms of what's considered normal. Now, when you go and get your blood work drawn for cholesterol, we all know if it's all, if it looks normal, it comes out saying normal, normal, normal. If it's elevated, though, sometimes will be in the red, it'll be colored red or have that high uh, next to it. Well, that all in all, uh, it can actually vary depending on what diseases have you had in the past? Are you otherwise healthy? Have you already had heart disease or maybe even a stroke in the past? Uh, do you come from a family history where a lot of people were having heart disease at earlier ages, like in their 40s or 50s? Well, you may have different cholesterol targets that we need to aim for than somebody who has a family history that where everybody lived into their 90s and they're doing okay. So your targets may be different based on your background, your genetics, and then also what else is going on in you. Do you have diabetes? Are you a smoker? What's your age? Those kinds of things. So your doctor can help uh, you think about that. And there's actually calculators online if you're interested in that to help you understand that. Um, so there are, uh, there are uh, lots of ways to think about cholesterol, um, and, uh, and we can help you kind of understand where, where you fall. So can you talk a little bit about foods that would cause you to have high cholesterol? I think that's important as well um, to identify some of the things we can do to help keep our cholesterol lower. Yeah. So the uh, typical foods we, we tell our uh, advise our patients to avoid uh, when they have high cholesterol are foods that are high in saturated fats, um, foods that uh, are predominantly red meats, uh, and foods that are more heavily fried or using animal fat uh, in, in, in the cooking. So we, we know that those types of diets, especially if used daily or in excess, then that can lead to elevated cholesterol. And that's a dietary reason to have elevated cholesterol. Now, there are a lot of reasons to have elevated cholesterol that are just not connected to the way you eat. It could be the way you're exercising or the way you're using your body to try to burn off some of those extra fats. And if you're not burning it off with exercise, then the cholesterol numbers are going to rise. So it's important to combat this with changes in the diet, but also in the way that you're moving and exercising. The other thing that goes overlooked sometimes is that there are some components in our cholesterol, specifically our triglycerides. It's one of the numbers that come back in your cholesterol panel when you get that. And the triglycerides oftentimes will be elevated when you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates. And uh, so if you're, if you're the kind of person that loves to eat uh, snacks that come in packages, Usually snacks that come in packages have high carbohydrates. And if you're eating, and so we always say avoid the middle of the grocery store because that's where all the goods are that come in packages. Try to stay on the edges of the grocery store because that's where you'll avoid those packages. Well, those packages that have processed carbohydrates um, that come from wheat flour or other grains, those are going to raise your carbohydrate intake. And when your body has too much carbohydrate, especially that very dense carbohydrate that historically we were not used to digesting, now your body's going to be overwhelmed with all that uh, excess carbs, and it's going to convert it to triglycerides because it doesn't know what to do with it. So your cholesterol can actually be lowered by lowering your carbohydrate. So it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of uh, your body is a big interchanger of all these nutrients at times. So at what point if a patient is having high cholesterol or high blood pressure and it cannot be controlled with diet or exercise, would you intervene? And what would, at that point, what would the treatment options be? Yeah, so, um, so traditionally we like to give diet exercise as much time to take effect uh, if the patient is making upward progress. If we come to a plateau where, hey, this is the most of my exercise I can get and look, I mean, I work a, a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. job. I try to cook as healthy as I can, but this is as best as I'm going to get. Then at that point, we 
uh, look at what the status is for blood pressure and cholesterol. And then we say, well, if you haven't hit those targets based on the, re the numbers that we need to be seeing based on the other conditions you have, now we need to implement some treatment, whether that be for blood pressure lowering or for cholesterol reduction. And uh, uh, the, the traditional medications used for cholesterol reduction are statins. Um, but blood pressure medicines are, there are a host of different blood pressure medicines that are, are utilized. And a lot of times it's based on what other conditions are going on in the body because you kind of want to uh, sort of knock out two birds with one stone because a lot of these blood pressure medicines, let some will be good for kidneys uh, protection as well as lowering the blood pressure. Some will be better for uh, maybe breathing better as well as for uh, uh, lowering the blood pressure. Some may be better for patients who have a weakened heart muscle and then also need to lower their blood pressure. Some may have prostate issues and have blood pressure. So we can choose specific medicines that can knock out two things with one medication. So we have a myth buster question that came in. Uh, is it true that salt can raise your blood pressure? So should you avoid salt if you um, have high blood pressure? Yeah, great question. So why do you think they keep salted peanuts at the bars? It's because they want you to drink more. When you eat something salty, you get thirsty. That's a natural human response. And the, when you're young, you're able to increase that amount of water that you take in and your kidneys will push that water out. And uh, when, as our body ages and the blood vessels become more resistant, then there is a problem. That, that salt that you used to be okay with uh, eating now that excess water that you're drinking after eating the salt, it stays in the blood vessels for a little bit longer than it used to. It, it, it will cause the blood pressure to then rise afterwards. And if you're eating heavy salt diets every single day, then that can be one of the biggest reasons that people develop early onset hypertension. So, so it is true. Higher salt diets lead to high blood pressure, but not necessarily in the younger healthy patients. But if that same pattern and lifestyle continues as they age, it will eventually cause problems in most people. So let's jump over and talk a little bit about heart attacks. Um, can you talk about heart attacks in women versus men um, and what sort of the symptoms and signs are of if you're having a heart attack? So a heart attack is, uh, so going back to that car engine uh, analogy, think of a heart attack as a block in the fuel line to your car. So you're pouring the gas in, but for some reason the gas can't get to the engine. That is uh, a heart attack. So the heart attack is we have arteries that supply blood and the needed oxygen that our heart muscle needs in order to continuously pump. Our heart muscle is the only muscle and only organ in the body that continues to pump regardless what we do, whether we're awake, whether we're sleeping, it does more if we're more exertional, it does less, but it's always beating. And because of that, it needs to have a constant supply of oxygen. If you lose that oxygen supply, that's a heart attack. And so um, what, where it usually comes from is a blocked artery that usually cause, is caused by a blood clot that literally Think about it as piping. Uh, we all of us in Houston know all about pipes now after our winter storm. But if you have a block in your pipe that goes to the heart, that's a heart attack. So the symptoms can sometimes be different in a, in a, in a man versus a woman. So the classic symptoms for a heart attack are a sudden onset of severe chest heaviness that almost feels like uh, the way most people have described it is an elephant sitting on their chest. So it's a severe symptom. It's not subtle. It feels like somebody is suffocating you by just compressing your chest and not allowing you to breathe. Oftentimes, it'll be associated with sweating. Uh, it'll be associated with clamminess, that kind of feeling like you're dizzy or going to pass out, and a lot of times with shortness of breath. Now, that is the classic symptoms of a heart attack. In women, they can have those symptoms when they're experiencing a heart attack, but oftentimes they have other symptoms in place of the chest heaviness. They oftentimes will have shortness of breath. They can have palpitations, nausea or vomiting, or a feeling of indigestion. And it's unclear why the symptomatology is different between men and women, but we observe that, uh, and it's been well reported that, that you cannot ignore symptoms in a woman, in a woman even though it doesn't sound like a classic heart attack. And so if you have symptoms that are concerning, it's best to just get evaluated just to be sure.
Um, so are heart attacks more common in men or women? So they are more common in men, uh, but the thing to not be overlooked is that in women, the most common cause of death and disease is heart disease. And if you ask a woman, if you poll uh, female uh, audiences, they will always say the most common condition that afflicts women is breast cancer. And, and that was that purely uh, was because of a great marketing strategy by the Susan B. Komen Foundation to promote breast cancer awareness. But in the process, uh, uh, everyone forgot that heart disease is actually the number one killer in women. So recently in the last five years, 10 years really, uh, American Heart Association has made more progress in bringing that awareness up, but it still remains that women, the number one cause of death and disease is heart disease. So we hear, um, you know, I'm popping on social media, looking at things, um, and you see buzzwords on social media, like widow maker, blockages, um, can you explain some of these sort of, you know, buzzwords? What what do they mean? Yeah. So the so the widow maker has uh, uh, classically been uh, used to that phrase is used used to describe a blockage of the main artery going down the front of the heart. It's typically uh, thought to be the most important artery. It's called the left anterior descending artery. And, and typically it is such an important artery to most people's hearts that if that were to be suddenly blocked, so if that pipe gets blocked, they, it's, it's very common that that patient doesn't even have time to make it to the hospital. And, and that, that's the unfortunate term widow maker. Now that has those, that epidemiology has actually changed as uh, EMS has uh, developed better strategies to uh, diagnose people in their house with on-site EKGs, make quick phone calls and by digital technologies now to our emergency rooms and can start uh, treatment, but with certain things out in the field, uh, including shocking people's hearts uh, to bring them back to life and getting them to the nearest emergency room where a cardiologist can potentially uh, save that person's life by opening up that blockage. But time is of the essence. Um, and uh, the longer somebody waits with chest pain, the, the less likely that they are going to come out with a good outcome. So if there is anybody you or anybody you know is having those symptoms, remember time is of the essence and you can prevent that issue from becoming a widow maker if you get that patient immediately to an emergency room. So, so technology and medical advances have changed a lot, but that is, that is classically where that terminology came from. Okay, so we have, we have just a few more minutes with you, and we do have a few questions that are coming in. Um, one is actually about youth and youth sports. Um, so you're hearing, you know, um, more issues about heart attacks or other cardiovascular issues with children um, while they're playing youth sports. Is that a new development, or are we just hearing more about it because we now have more prevalent outlets for media? Yeah, so that's always uh, been an issue. And, and in the sports medicine world, um, there's a big focus on how to screen young athletes uh, before competitive play. And, uh, and, and so that's a very important concept to know. So for your kids, as well as uh, uh, um, just thinking about um, uh, sports in general, it's, it's best if they're going to be in line to play competitively that they uh, be at least meet, go and meet with their personal physician. They actually do not need to meet with a cardiologist per se, but a personal physician, their primary care physician that can run some basic tests, including uh, an EKG. Um, and oftentimes the physical exam uh, and talking to the patient to understand were there any red flag signs or symptoms when they are doing their practices or any uh, previous competitive play that they've had, uh, by picking up on subtle signs and symptoms, they can send them for appropriate next step testing that then may be able to diagnose certain inherited conditions. Usually it's of the muscle of the heart or the electrical system of the heart that tends to be the issue at that age. There are some rare conditions where the arteries of the heart um, have a abnormality that they were born with that only presents to be a problem when they're starting competitive play. So it's important to 
kind of meet with a doctor, go through any potential concerning symptoms, and if necessary, take those next steps. And in some cases, that does require coming to see a cardiologist. Um, so a question came in about surgery, um, specifically open heart surgery. At what point, you know, does that come into play? Is it you have a heart attack or symptoms of a heart attack and then you have open heart surgery? Or is it something you would know about well in advance if you're already undergoing treatment for high blood pressure or, you know, high cholesterol? So that can come uh, sometimes as a surprise and sometimes it's uh, over a course of a long period of treatment. So there are patients uh, of ours who under, uh, uh, suffer a heart attack and then in the process of work, uh, evaluating them and diagnosing them at the hospital, the recommendation is for them to have open heart surgery. It's all based on the types of blockages. We have, remember those fuel lines going to the engine in the car? We have three fuel lines that go to our heart, uh, three major fuel lines. And we're looking at whether there's blockages in one, two, or all three of those fuel lines. And depending on where and how many of those blockages there are, we may recommend stents or we may recommend open heart surgery. Now, there are some other conditions that aren't so sudden, like a heart attack, some conditions like chest pain every time you walk, it's called angina. And uh, if you're experiencing angina, which is a chest heaviness, not severe like an elephant sitting on you, but uh, a pressure on the chest every time you get up to go do something or you're trying to get that exercise program started and every time you get on the treadmill, you notice a chest heaviness. That's something to talk to your doctor and your cardiologist and go see a cardiologist about because that may be an early sign of not a 100% blockage of an artery, but maybe a 70, 80% blockage of an artery that if diagnosed early, uh, we could prevent problems that are coming down the line uh, with the appropriate medications and if needed, uh, surgeries that may involve stents or bypass. Um, and so it's uh, bypass is one part of the possible treatments of uh, heart conditions, but there are so many other things, diet, lifestyle, medications, um, and other counseling that can help change lifestyle behaviors, uh, including things like smoking uh, and other, uh, other habits that a patient may want to stop. Um, so I think this is a great question that came in. At what point would you recommend an EKG um, part as part of normal annual routine care for a patient? Or is that not necessary ever? So um, the uh, EKG is uh, used under certain uh, scenarios to help uh, diagnose and understand the inner workings of a patient. It's not the end all be all of how your heart is working. It's more an assessment of the electrical impulses going through your heart. And then it can give us hints as to what's the size of the heart. Are there potential scars of the heart from the past that we need to further investigate why that may have happened? Um, are there potential issues with the way the heart is conducting its electricity? And, and oftentimes we're getting EKGs more commonly on patients with symptoms, uh, think things that symptoms that we are trying to investigate actively what is going on. In some cases, other conditions you have, like high blood pressure um, or other medications you may be put on, may require getting an EKG. But I, I would say that in your younger years, it's not necessary to get an EKG every year. It's not going to help with uh, your uh, overall health, and it's more the dietary lifestyle, what you're, how you're using that heart, that's actually where your focus should be at that time. Okay, so I know we're wrapping up. We have one minute before 1.30. Um, we're going to throw in one last question that came in. Um, does race impact your heart health? Uh, great question. So more and more studies are showing that, yes, it does. Um, in the uh, African-American uh, and Hispanic population, there is higher incidence of the risk factors that lead to heart disease. So what does that mean? There are some things that are in your control. Uh, to, uh, uh, to change about how your body's working. And there's some things that are out of your control. It's passed within our DNA and it's, it's genetically uh, within us. And what we're finding is that there is more genetic predisposition uh, to conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, even obesity uh, that are more prominent in the Hispanic and African-American population uh, than in the Caucasian and the uh, Asian-American population which then will lead to a higher incidence of heart disease in the Hispanic and African-American population. So it's ever more important 
to understand your racial background, to understand where you come from, what your fa family and parents and relatives had to deal and manage with uh, over the course of their life, to understand what are the implications on your current life and what do you need to know sooner than later so that you get a head start on treating those things before you're acting uh, in rewind and trying to act after the fact. Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone who tuned in with us today. Um, if you want to go ahead and reference this you know, discussion in the future, we will have it posted on our website um, under kelseysebel.com slash careconnectcombos. So you can always pop onto that website um, and then you can explore previous discussions and Q&A sessions we've had with our physicians as well. And we do have some great events coming up in April. So April 7th, we will have a COVID-19 update with Dr. Melanie Mazoon, where we'll be discussing um, you know, new information from the CDC, updates on vaccine, herd immunity, um, and doing some myth busting with her as well. And then April 21st, we are going to have a conversation with Dr. Desiree Thomas, a neurologist at Kelsey Siebold, um, about understanding migraines. So we hope that some of you will tune in later. Um, please go ahead and RSVP for those events. If you're interested in joining us, we do have limited spots, even though we're virtually or virtual right now. Um, and again, thank you so much, Dr. Wagley, for taking time out of your schedule um, to have this really important conversation with us about heart health. If you have any questions or you need to see a cardiologist at Kelsey, we have a 24-7 contact center that you can call. That number is 713-442-0000. You can also go on our website, kelsey-siebold.com and learn more about all of the cardiologists we have at Kelsey Siebold um, if you're in need of a cardiologist. So thank you again, Dr. Wagley and everyone who joined us today. We hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. All right. Thank you. Thanks.